I am associate professor of English and I am the chair of the English department. I teach in environmental studies as well, of course, and then I'm public engagement officer for the Association of the Study of Literature and Environment. Um, and so I've been working on a spotlight series where we're featuring artists and writers right now. It's a six month long thing. So email me if you want to know more about that as well. There's some really cool stuff where people are being featured with their environmental work. Um, and I publish and teach and write about environmental studies. So research and writing in environmental studies, um, environmental literature, which I'm teaching this semester. Some of the students are here. Um, intro to environmental studies. And um, I generally write about gender and science fiction, especially um, in environment. So some things like hopeful eco-media in the pandemic, and some of the students who co-wrote that with me are in the audience today too, I think. Um, and environmental issues of some journals and science fiction and some pieces on Black Lives Matter and COVID during environmental uh, movements. And so some things that make all of this very thrilling for me to talk about today. And Dr. Soderstrom also does tons of cool things. Yeah, uh, I try. Um, I'm Mark Soderstrom. I'm an associate professor of history in the history department. Um, and I teach and am the director of environmental studies uh, major. Um, and my research is actually on the history of the Russian Empire, uh, mm -hmm. which isn't this. Uh, but uh, when I was in grad school, uh, I remember finishing my first class in a world history survey and feeling proud of myself that it didn't go totally badly. And then I read a, a book called Something New Under the Sun, uh, an environmental history of the 20th century. And the, the author rattled off all these themes of the 20th century, women's liberation, the world wars. And, and then he said, none of that stuff will really matter 100 years from now as people start to think about the, the great risk we're taking with our environment. And, uh, and I thought, oh, shoot, I guess I'll have to do it again differently uh, next time. <laughs> kind of ever since then, environmental themes have been kind of fundamental to what I teach and read about and write about. Um, so uh, what we're going to try to do here is, is introduce you to our three artists um, by having them talk a little bit about kind of what they do and some of the big themes of their work, uh, but do it in the context of a couple particular pieces that we'll be able to look at uh, as, as they're talking. Um, so I'll turn it over to Alice Hartman first, and she can tell us a little bit about what, what she does. Okay. Um, I'm Alice Hargrave. I'm a photo-based artist based in Chicago, and I work with sound, video, and photography to speak to habitat loss, impermanence, and often species extinctions. Um, and I really, my modus operandi now is wanting to put the work to work. And I am demonstrating tonight putting the work to work because this is basically an activist fashion statement where the a line of clothing is the bird calls of a species called the white stork. And a fashion designer in Paris saw the pattern. She wanted to do a line of clothing. I agreed to do the line of clothing as long as all the proceeds went back to the birds and I got one dress. So here's my dress. <laughs> we got to write a nice big fat check to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So I want to put the work to work in real terms, in activist terms. And this is another example of putting the work to work. It's actually the same pattern as I'm wearing. And it's a way of putting the patterns on glass to, pre excuse me, to prevent bird collision. Mm -hmm. So we live in uh, right along the Mississippi Flyway, which is one of the most traveled migratory paths. And our city of Chicago is one of the most dangerous cities for bird populations. So if we could put patterns on glass, and it can be done in a much more discreet way than that, which people worry about breaking up the view, but actually it can be done where it's pretty much transparent. <laughs> so anyway, that's a whole other story, but I want to put the work to work on glass, save bird lives, raise money, etc. So this is um, another example of a project that is based about climate change. And each one of these patterns is a portrait of a global lake. We did portraits of lakes from all seven continents and it shows how each lake is changing due to climate change. Um, some lakes are shrinking because of the desertification, some lakes are growing because glaciers are going extinct and melting. So I worked with GLEON, the Global Lakes Environmental Observatory Network, 
and with limnologists or people who study lakes from all around the world. And uh, this was down at ISU. We're doing a book right now about the project um, as well, Illinois State University in Bloomington. So um, that was the project of the lakes. This is the Audubon pictures that are in the other room that you just saw. And the background is a portrait of the Rosette Spoonbill, mm -hmm. which is an Audubon, a bird that was also imaged in the 32 species of the Audubon portfolio from 1832 that I was tracing. I set out to find those 32 birds on an artist's residency in the Florida Keys and Dry Tortugas. So that wallpaper is the Rosette Spoonbill. It's the color of the bird. I got sick of hearing, why save that dumb brown bird? When I started, one of the most threatened birds was the Florida Grasshopper Sparrow. And I kept hearing this ubiquitous refrain, why save that dumb brown bird? Well, it might have hot pink feet or bright yellow eyes. So I want to let the color be advocacy for the species or the bird. And that's the um, sea star that's in the other room which is about acoustic ecology and about how we're using sound to revive habitat. So I'm collaborating with a scientist out of England who is um, putting the sounds of healthy reefs on decimated reefs to attract fish into areas where they're transplanting corals to rebuild reef systems. And he's working in the Great Barrier Reef. He shared with me the sounds that are in the exhibit around the corner. Um, so I, I want the work to be upbeat too and positive and to show ways that we can make change and we can put the work to work. My name is Lindsay Olson and I make art about science. So my work takes me out of the studio to places like uh, Fermi National Accelerator Lab where I was the first artist in residence. Um, I had the opportunity to work with the CMS experiment at CERN. Um, I worked with the University of New Hampshire and went to sea with ocean acousticians to learn about how acoustics illuminates the ocean environment. And most weirdly of all, I worked in a wastewater treatment plant, the largest one in the world as a matter of fact. This is um, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District's um, Stickney plant. And um, yeah, that's where I actually fell in love with science. and pretty much figured out that if I used my training as an artist, I could learn the science, I could tell the real story of water in a dense urban area, and use it as advocacy for the value of science. Because all of us depend on science every day um, for almost everything we do, but it's so ubiquitous and so seamless in our lives that we forget that just in our cell phone, for example, there's about 36 material science applications going on. So it's a really rich form of, of supporting the work of scientists plus, you know, what you were saying, Alice, about how you have to draw people in with beauty. So even in the wastewater treatment plant, I was working on uh, creating art that's beautiful and engaging to use it um, as outreach for science. So the project that I want to talk about tonight are the two large textile pieces that are in the lobby. Um, I became interested in the formation of the dead zone <coughs> in the Gulf of Mexico. It's getting larger every year, and I think one year was a couple, like two years ago, the measurements were that it's the size of Connecticut, if you can imagine. Yeah. And it's an area where if you, it's a low oxygen area in the Gulf, and if you cannot swim away, you die. So it's uh, impacting, making a huge impact for people whose lives depend on um, fishing, so you can imagine what your commute might be if you had to cross the size of Connecticut to you know, chase the fish wherever they're going, but it has huge environmental impacts. So what I learned was that the formation of the dead zone is tied with land use practices in the Mississippi River Basin. And the way that we are farming, wastewater treatment discharge and um, animal feedlots are, the res are responsible for the majority of the chemicals that are washing into the waterways and creating this dead zone. Um, the next slide, please. Yeah. So this is a piece about regenerative agriculture that is the exact opposite of monoculture. And I wanted to express the value of this kind of farming because it works in harmony with nature. It's about using the same circular sort of um, interrelated, interdependent systems that nature uses 
to farm so that, for example, the, the earth is spongier, it holds more water. There's a microbial community that's active and alive that isn't active in conventional agriculture. Um, but between these two systems, if we could have the next slide, please, um, there is a third alternative. This is um, Lowell Gentry, who works in the Crop Sciences Department at the University of Illinois. And he is doing research on finding ways that mitigate the runoff without completely changing our farm system immediately. One of those changes is um, cover cropping in the winter, which is keeping living roots in the soil that allows it to soak up nutrients. And his research shows that 50% of the problem for hypoxia could be cured if everyone in the basin practiced cover cropping in the winter. Other things that you can do that are sort of intermediate are low-till, no-till farming, and very targeted application of um, synthetic fertilizers and herbicides. So um, I also like, Alice, how you were talking about um, putting your artwork to work. It's very meaningful for me to be able to use my skills as an artist to help bring um, these sorts of issues to the public. So I thank you for bringing that up too. Um, my name is Barbara Chure, and I am actually half of a collaborative team with uh, Lindsay Lockman, who unfortunately is not here tonight. Um, we, you know, listening to these wonderful uh, explanations about uh, the larger world, well, the basis for our series started in our kitchen, mm -hmm. and um, there's plenty of science going on there. Um, we both raised children and uh, sort of navigated through the fraught landscape of how to keep them nourished and the you know the 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 how we rewarded them with special blue cake or f special foods and and um, it had us wandering into this whole um, landscape really of um, what we were considering the uncharted territory of processed foods so this, uh, this image is called Fruit Loops Landscape from a series um, of ours called uh, Processed Views, um, uh, Surveying the Industrial Landscape. And uh, it is in fact it was something we created in our studio using processed foods. We built these landscapes that were tabletop, <laughs> tabletop um, images. And uh, we based them on some images from uh, Carlton Watkins, who was an, a, a photographer in the 1860s, who was exploring the American West. And we saw the parallels between um, how th his images both worked as advertisement and enticement for expansion into the West. And it seemed like we were on a similar track when it came to processed foods, like we were pushing into this uncharted territory, really. And, and uh, so we were using those metaphors in the creation of these landscapes. So there's a series of 10 of them. Um, we identified the 10, uh, um, they're probably more than that, plenty more than that, but 10 fat, sugar, salt, saturated fats. Um, monoculture uh, and and some of the images um, you know there's there you can see them in the gallery but um, we were looking at um, the way that you know the way we consume and how and what we consume and also the way that uh, what we're doing to both our the unintended consequences for our health and for the environment and the ways that um, the landscape is changing as it uh, begins to grow food for the processed food industry. So, um, this is called Monoculture Plains. Anyone living in Illinois will recognize the cornflakes and the corn. And uh, a second series that's in the gallery is called Vital Signs of the Planet. And um, you can sit on the earth stool and page through the book, Recipes for Disaster. So what's, on the, uh, what's printed on paper plates that are on the wall in front of it is um, data from NASA, um, climate data. And in doing the research for this project, um, we encountered the massive amounts of data that are out there. And, 
that become impenetrable. I mean, we all know we're inundated with the facts about what's happening, but you can't, you can't see or taste carbon dioxide. So how, how could we make that visceral? How do we make it? Um, and, and so we said, well, we could, do, uh, we could do a cookbook, and maybe we can talk about these terrible recipes that we're, <laughs> that we're leading toward. So uh, this is baked Alaska, and uh, the recipe says, ingredients, heat trapping gases from air pollution, starving polar bears, destroyed phytoplankton, beached whales, uh, preheat atmosphere with carbon dioxide, uh, stir heat trapping gases into Arctic region, thaw permafrost until lightly brown, increase heat by reducing reflectivity, add waters of sea ice melting glaciers and eroding ice shelves, let sea levels rise, ready when low-lying coastal areas across the globe are submerged. So they were these, um, you know, the idea about what recipes are. I had inherited a recipe box from my mother, and the idea that you're passing them down from one generation to the next, also, that you don't have to cook them. You know, you got a cookbook, you can turn the page. <laughs> so there was a bit of agency, and as you turn the pages of these cookbooks, you have choices about whether or not those are recipes you actually want to follow. Um, and um, that's... So that was really great. Um, really admirably concise and informative at the same time. Um, one question I had uh, is, is kind of biographical. I'm, I'm always fascinated by how, how do people become not just interested in environmental issues, but concerned enough about them to, to make it fundamental to kind of what they do and who they are. So could each of you just tell us a little bit about, I mean, how long have you been doing art with an, a focus on the environment? Was there like a, a moment or an experience that inclined you to, to make that to the focus of your work? Um, do you want to get us started? You can say that. Sure. Um, <laughs> well, the natural world has been a subject of my work since I started making work. Um, and I feel like over the years I've approached it from a lot of different directions. And I feel that my work is informed by what I hear in the news, what I hear um, and what I'm faced with. Um, with the birds, they literally started shouting at me. And I never paid attention to birds. And from one day to the next, they just started shouting at me. I can't tell you anything more than they just looked at me a little too long. And we had this connection. And I was like, damn, I'm becoming my mother. You know, like, <laughs> you say the birds? And that's how it started were the birds, and I can date that to 2006, when they, ex I know exactly when I started paying attention to birds, and birds started paying attention to me, so I felt there was this connection there. So. Could you uh, just say a little bit about the Cornell lab, and, and so when you describe your dress as one particular bird, can you explain the, the Cornell lab to people who haven't kind of read that backstory to this? Sure. Or how are the waves the bird, in other words, tell me a little bit well, about that. The, the um, interest in the sound wave patterns of the bird calls came when I came across hearing and seeing the sound wave patterns of the last male of the Kauai O'O bird calling out to a non-existent female. And that just to me was just so gut-wrenching and horrific. And just the thought of this last male of this species, and it, that was the end. That was the last voice. And seeing that last voice die out visually in a pattern. And then I got to learn about the Cornell Lab, which is basically a library of sound. So they have a library of all sorts of animals there in recordings. And so I was thinking about that. And then I went to the site. and and then fell in love with the kind of hieroglyphic-like patterns and think of them as almost like a Rosetta Stone for bird language. And I just thought they were beautiful and each bird has a different pattern and so I would photograph the patterns and then string them together into larger patterns. And all the work that I do about the birds raises money for the birds. Um, so that's just ethically for me. I don't make money on any of the bird work. It all goes back to the lab. So. Great. So the birds started talking to Alice in 2006. Lindsay, was there a moment for you? Uh, like 
that where you came to not talk to the birds, but yes. decide to do environmental came art. Came to science. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like many artists, I really tried very hard to avoid science and math in school. <laughs> and um, it was a real challenge to do that, but I managed it. Um, and earlier in my career, I had been painting idealized views of the Chicago area waterways. And I was editing out things like buildings and parking lots and power lines, trying to evoke a kind of idealistic waterway. And around the time um, that I was doing this, my husband and I bought a canoe. And we were canoeing down the Cal Sake Channel, and we passed this amazing engineered waterfall, which I later learned was called the SEPA station. And it was created to add oxygen to the sluggish canal, and it was tied to that wastewater treatment plant. So I, I had sort of this epiphany idea that, well, maybe that would be a lot more interesting to make the story about where, what this is all about, the real story of water, than it would be to do idealistic, impressionistic oil painting. So it took me about 18 months to get into the wastewater treatment plant with patient pestering and whatever. And I, I did have an epiphany sitting next to the aeration tank, which was the place where the majority of the cleaning of the water. I was like, wow. I could use my art to figure out, you know, draw the pipes, draw the valves. I can kind of like draw the microbes and figure out what's happening with that. I can use my training as an artist to learn real science. So the acid test was to find a home to show that artwork. Um, art about poop is not especially popular. <laughs> it was a really hard sell. But Fermilab has an art gallery and I thought, you know, those are science people. I bet they'd be interested in this art. So Georgia Schwender, who is sharing the cases with me, who could not be here tonight, um, Georgia said, uh, she, she said, you know, for a long time, I've wanted to have an artist residency program. Would you like to help me set one up? And I was like, my first thought was, yes, of course. It's not taking 18 months to get in. Yes, of course. <laughs> my second thought was, holy smokes, this is high energy physics. This is like the acid test. Can I really use science, my art to learn that kind of science? So I you know, said yes foolishly before I thought it through completely <laughs> and leapt in and it was like, yeah, okay, it works. I'm home. So that was the beginning. Well, you, Barbara, did you, have a, did you have a moment at some point? Yeah, uh, well, the, the Process Views um, series, I, I submitted it to an online call for junk food, and uh, it was, uh, while we were getting these pings saying, can we use, can we reblog your, it was in the moment when things were, blog, people were blogging, <laughs> and blogs would go, and in, in about two days, that work went viral all over the internet. Um, from high-end food and wine magazines to um, uh, very popular in Europe, in Japan, and it discussed in the realm where countries that are more careful about introducing genetically modified foods to their food systems and have different relationships to agriculture. We didn't know if they were using it like damning the US or but that wasn't necessarily what was happening. But then the work was um, was appearing in these amazing places suddenly discussing food and class and food access and food justice. Because when you look at a picture of, of Fruit Loops, you may see, depending on your relationship to Fruit Loops, you may see paradise or you may see hell. You know, and, um, but uh, some people were saying that you know they they always that was a that was an amazing thing for them to look at that and think that's my dream landscape. We couldn't afford to buy. Um, name brand foods. We always got generic foods and realizing. Food access is a very complicated topic. So when this work started, you know, it just it it opened up this potential that work could be accessible, not didactic, but approached in all of these different topics. And um, and then um, <coughs> after that, the Vital Signs of the Planet and the Recipes for Disaster book. Um, again, using this language of food, everyone eats, it's incredibly an accessible and wonderful topic um, to be open-ended enough so that you can approach, the, approach it. Um, however, when the, under the last administration, when the, when the um, website for the environmental 
Protection Agency was taken down for a year and a half and when it was relaunched, the pull down menu for climate change was now buried way into the site and I realized um, that the, this information was disappearing and again I had just inherited this recipe box and I was thinking, well then we need to make the cookbook, you know, and, and make sure it gets passed down to the next generation. And uh, so um, it was a bit reactionary, and, uh, but however, it also talked about the value of uh, using a topic that everyone can relate to. Great. I love that. I think that trifecta of evangelical, southern, and poor, I can't walk past that fruit loop without salivating. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's the wrong message. <laughs> Every time I walk by it, I just want to lick it. <laughs> um, I love the party. Um, so we, the students here know that uh, I talk a lot about hope, especially in the last couple of years. When, you know, environmental studies can be so depressing and it can be so hard to engage people. And we've all talked about the storytelling and how do you draw people in. Um, Rebecca Solnit writes that even the worst crises can have this really hopeful push because it makes us realize that if terrible things can happen, if the world can be masked all within a day or two, right? If we can all be stuck at home within a day, then we're also able to make positive change. And I'm wondering how y'all balance that hope and the terrible news. And maybe we'll start with you, Barbara, because that, that satire you're doing is really lovely. That was such a, it was just a terrible project to research, <laughs> you know, coming up with those recipes. And I kept thinking, oh, I, I need to have a, a page at the end that says like, these are places you can donate to or, yeah. you know, advocacy groups or, um, but, you know, there is a long history in, in consumer advocacy and, uh, you know, the, the, another thing that we got into in our research was just like, you know, with suburban women who got food label, you know, food dates, expiration dates put onto food and um, your money, you know, you, where you spend your money and, how, you know, so there was a, consumer choice aspect to that, but um, I also realized that one of the functions of art is not necessarily to answer the questions. Mm -hmm. It's to hopefully make work that is open-ended enough so as people can bring their own questions to it, and, and that it's, it was a very push-pull about wanting to provide the answer, but I think work can get very didactic that way and be off-putting when you tell someone what to think. Um, and so their ability to come to it, and I, I think that's when, um, that's what you hope for making, or I hope for making work, that it can raise questions. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember reading the Yale put out a climate it was a, a sort of a poll about people who think climate change isn't happening and those who are really activist and concerned. And that if you could move someone a tiny bit along the scale toward really concerned, that they were much more likely to be conscious about who they're voting for and how politics are factoring in. Because there's a lot of political will involved in that and we do have agency in that as yeah. well. And Carrots rather than whips, right? We talk about that a lot in classes, that we, we tend to focus, like hope gets us going more than, mm -hmm. and connection gets us going more than fear does oftentimes, right? Mm -hmm. Fear works too. <laughs> what about you? Hope and, and dismay, how do you balance that? Yeah, well, part of my project um, for Land and Sea involved looking at two USGS water gauges, super gauges, one on the Illinois River and one on the Mississippi River. And so I started in February and I created a log book and I was documenting all of the chemicals that were like washing in and what the oxygenation rates were in the water, what the flow of the water was. And the closer we got to spring planting and the application of fertilizers, these numbers were appalling. It was uh, one day in May, there was two, no, two million pounds of nitrogen in one day washing in from like the farm fields. And I, I did that for like six months and I couldn't do it anymore. It's like, okay, I have to put this aside. Um, it's appalling to me that the science education 
is so, I don't know, people are just so anti-science, not really understanding that clean water, clean air, and healthy soil are what is required for us to live as humans and to make the planet work. So I think what I try to do in my work is, in order to like avoid the frustration of people you know, turning away, is to use the secret weapon that artists use, and that is beauty. And to try to draw people in with beauty and to make sure that the artwork meets people where they are, not drags them into some place. So for example, I tried to make the work as engaging as possible, so that even if somebody isn't interested in the science, they are interested in looking at the art, engaging with the art, so that maybe if they run across a story in the paper about um, nitrogen runoff from fields or hypoxia or monoculture, um, they might go, oh yeah, I saw an art show about that. Maybe I could learn a little bit more about that. So it's an, the art is an invitation. And that to me feels like um, a hopeful kind of way to approach the work. And with that, a question and an invitation for the Well, I also am um, very much involved with the strategy of using color and light and beauty and the natural color and light and beauty of natural elements to draw in viewers into an experiential space, whether it be with sound or color or what have you, in order to engage an audience and hopefully inspire them to think about things in a different way, experience things in a different way. But it is a struggle all the time because we're all bombarded with this news on a daily basis. And um, so we do what we can do. We try not to be jaded or parallel, paralyzed, excuse me. Um, but when you first brought up what gives you the hope, for me what came to mind first was working with really young children and kids and last summer I had the opportunity to work with Christian Cooper who came to um, Illinois for a show I had at the Freeport Art Museum and for those of you who don't remember Christian Q. Cooper was the guy who was accosted by a certain Karen in Central Park he's the birder of Central Park African-American guy uh, it happened on the same day as George Floyd was murdered. So it just was a pivotal moment. And Christian Cooper came, the curator got Christian Cooper to come to my show. I spent four days with him. And I was just enamored with the process of working with him and working with kids. And we outright reached to kids for four days and took them birding, took, took them on bird walks. and. The magic of their excitement just blew my mind. And, and I'm working with kids next week. I'm going to first grade to a school. I'm working with a project with um, Open Lands Organization called Birds in My Neighborhood. And we, they outreach to schools across the Chicago land area, mostly underserved schools. And we basically go in for three consecutive weeks working with students. The first week's in class, the second week is a bird walk in the neighborhood of the school, and the third visit is a field trip. So if we can show people what's out there, young children, I mean, how can we expect anyone to protect something that they don't know about? So the idea being to uh, open their eyes to what's there so they know what to protect. So I think building stewards amongst young people is what gives me hope. So I think we've got about 20 minutes or so, so maybe we could take some questions from, from the audience. If you have general questions, that's great. If you, have, if you want to ask a particular question of a particular person, just make that clear. I'm sure we've got some very good questions brewing out there. So, jump in. <laughs> and, if, and if nobody has them, my students have been told to have them. <laughs> <laughs> they have to go back to class right after this. They do. Uh, yeah, we have class until 9.30 this. Uh, <laughs> I just have a process question. So, the pigment, it's not And then I um, go to a source of maybe 20 to 30 images of a particular species, 
an eyedropper out the color of the bird because uh, you know photo colors there's no truth in photography we knew this so but how to get the closest color of a bird without being able to be with the bird itself so I tried to get a color from the bird by averaging in the colors and then I <coughs> used those colors to color the sound wave patterns that are on the screen black and white and what are you uh, on pig the pigment prints are pigment inks on paper. Um, there's some prints in there on glass, so I like experimenting with different processes. And this pattern's also made into a jacquard weaving that's also in the other room. There's a weaving piece as well. And then the fashion designer took the photograph, took it to her um, mill her fabric mill where they took the colors from the photograph to make the silk. And then she designed all the details, <laughs> which is not my field. <laughs> it has a very specific curve and cut, and I am so not a fashionista. So um, it was kind of fun to work with. Dovima Paris. This is a Based on uh, Alice, your work, Sea Star, but I think it's it's open for anyone to answer. Uh, in the description of Sea Star, there's a process called fluorescence, where the coral, uh, as it's responding to warmer temperatures, becomes sort of vibrant and, and neon, um, which is, is beautiful, but we're maybe missing the message that it's, as you say in your description, crying for help. Are there other examples where maybe we're missing the, the cry for help and sort of misinterpreting uh, nature's call to us uh, for help? And is something that's maybe a beautiful process? Or? That's an excellent question. And I don't, I can't think of another thing off the top of my head. I'm sure that exists. Um, uh, what, what intrigued me with that was d using the last calls of the birds. So initially I didn't want to use the birds that were extinct. I wanted to use the birds that still had hope. Um, so I started with the five most threatened birds of North America and kind of went from there. But the last calls of the birds, I saw this parallel with the last calls of the coral. So that was kind of conceptually how I married those two together. And um, it is stunning how the color just shouts out. And yeah, um, it's it's you know, very frightening, and um, certain corals will survive ocean warming, and others just won't be able to. Um, but they do have those underwater trees that you can take a cutting from a coral, just like you take a cutting from a plant, and then they put them on these underwater trees and grow them underwater, and they take those cuttings and then transplant them into dead zones. And that's where, if you've got the cuttings, then if you can draw fish in to repopulate those areas with the sound. But um, I, I'm gonna think about that a lot because I'm sure there are other examples. I'm reading Flight Behavior right now by Barbara Kingsolver and that's an example of in the beginning where it's this beautiful thing happening, but yet it's a disaster. It's indicative of a larger, you know, right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that for me, one of the biggest issues to start with is making the invisible visible. Because as you say, you cannot care about something you can't see. And when you pass a farm field, a cornfield for example, it's really difficult to relate to the fact that underground where those roots are, there was a whole community that got completely disrupted. The soil is compacted. It's completely dead. Whereas a healthy prairie soil is loaded with life abundant with life, and all that life is interconnected. And unless you understand that the, the industrial agriculture is destroying soil, it's, we are eroding soil, we are headed for another dust bowl, is what we're, it's happening. And it's hard to care about this if you live in an urban area and you don't know farmers, you don't understand what sediments and chemicals are being washed off the field. So really the main job is making the invisible visible and knowing what you are seeing, what it is, because something just came to my mind in Europe, they have these orange skies, pinkish orange skies, 
but they're coming from uh, huge dust storms in the Sahara. Mm -hmm. So you could look at that and think, oh, it's a beautiful sunset. But no, it's dust that's blocking the light and coming from the Sahara. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to, I think, uh, Miranda, one of, our, one of the students is from Kern County. I'm just saying things about you, sorry. <laughs> um, is from Kern County, um, California, which is one of the, you know, the biggest producer agriculture. And so we've talked about, we've watched a, a show where it's like these beautiful orchards, right? It seems lovely. I like almonds, right? <laughs> but it's doing all of this terrible stuff that we can't see, right? Mm -hmm. Taking, um, it's rerouting all the water. Those, the water bank is being used up. It's being the public lands, the public resources are being taken by private companies. And so making the, the invisible visible, or bringing, thinking about that movie visible. is for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that you said similar too, right? That you draw, drawing people in with the colors, the beauty, the vibrancy, sometimes makes a difference. That's what, that's what draws them, but then you're you're getting all of that. You can't get um, color dye red. It's hard to paint that up. So sure, a fruit loop we can get fully, right? Lindsay, can you say a little bit about the ocean acoustics? Because uh, there's a really neat connection there with what you're doing in, in, with those plankton pieces and, and ocean acoustics, and, and you're obviously telling us about using sound to revive reefs. But can, can you There's so many connections with you yeah. guys. I'm really <laughs> loving this. Yeah, so when I went to sea, um, <clears throat> ocean acoustics is a relatively new science. Um, and these ocean acousticians were using two different kinds of sound ways of approaching sound in the sea. So one is passive acoustics, where you um, sink a, a microphone, a hydrophone, you leave it on the bottom of the ocean, and in this case, it um, was collecting data of the sound environment for six months at a time. The scientists would come back, pick up the recording, download it, and drop it back down. But one thing that was really eye-opening to me was the way we used active acoustics on board the ship. Now, active acoustics is on every ship at sea, but what scientists were doing was sending a ping of energy down into the water column um, to try to visualize what's going on under the water. Um, you can't really see beyond 200 meters into the ocean water because the light is just dimmed completely. So all the sorts of um, terrestrial applications for observation and recording and that sort of thing doesn't work in the ocean. So when you send that ping of sound from the transponder down into the water column, that energy um, wave bounces into life forms, sends a unique sonic signature back to the ship, and then helps identify what's happening in the water column. And what we saw was this extremely dramatic, gigantic daily migration, twice daily migration, of the mass of zooplankton that live in the gloomy layers below where it's dark and they can hide from predators because there's nowhere to hide in the open ocean. And then as soon as the sun goes down, this mass migration occurs where all these animals come surfacing. They feed at night and then when it's dawn, they go back down. And that was um, super dramatic. Now if, if scientists use just the acoustics data, they can't really confirm what's happening. So in addition to that active acoustics data, they do something called ground truthing, where they're dragging nets behind the boat down to where those animals look during the day and at night. They're bringing them up. They're having specialists look under microscopes to examine them. And so this, that project, um, Living in Light and Dark, is about the plankton and about how each, each one of those artworks has a, um, a kind of dance between the light parts and the dark parts, between the light part of the animal and the dark part of the animal. So there was this dance in the visual presentation of it. Um, there's also some really weird stuff going on with light. Copepods are like one of the third most abundant um, sources of food in the ocean. By the way, the plankton are like food for everybody. So they have to develop these really incredible strategies for survival. And copepods, when they're attacked, when they, when they feel in danger, like some, something's, a predator's near, they um, release from their rear ends this um, bioluminescent material that distracts the predator. But all of these things are hidden from us because mainly what we're doing is riding the surface of the ocean. We don't see what's happening underground. And it's the acoustics, it's the listening and the observing what happens to sound energy that really helps describe the ecosystem that we can't see or perceive. There's so much about perspective in that too, I think, right? Your, your work is about scale, yours is taking things that are usually in a bowl and 
making them into landscapes, right? Things that we don't see and putting them onto something. I think there's something really lovely about the, the way that you're going from the invisible to an aerial view of farm fields, right? That mm. scale is one of those things that helps us gain this new perspective that we don't have to stand in next to something, which is really lovely. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? I'm curious if you ever struggle with the idea of pointing a finger at something brings about its destruction. You know, like um, you using things in other ways, and then there's always people in the wings figuring out a way to use something to the end of its existence. I'm thinking specifically about um, a book about Never Cry Wolf, where because the scientists found the white wolves, the um, indigenous people killed them to buy false teeth. And just by the fact that they looked at them, caused the other people to look also in those. Do you ever struggle with that concept of um, your, your artwork? Maybe it doesn't. One of us, any of us? Sure, any of you. I hope uh, it destroys <laughs> <laughs> what I'm looking at, but that's, um, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, there, there are lots of languages involved in, in even like, uh, you, you know, for when I'm looking at food anyway, for the, um, the idea that, uh, you know, uh, Food flavors come from science, and science is a language. And you know that there's is there a difference when it's created in a lab and when it exists in 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 a natural state? And the scientists who work in the food food flavoring industry don't think so. They think we can create it, and you know so there's an interesting. Um, so so I'm not exactly answering your question, but it's an interesting point about how we look at things, from what, from what perspective we look at things, and that not everyone approaches, you know, the, the, um, not everyone thinks these things are bad or good or, or worth saving or worth destroying. It's, it's, it's like once you make a work of art, you really don't have that much control about how people are going to view it or incorporate it or um, build on it or ignore it. So I think I think that's a tough issue. Who would know? Never cry wolf would have caused the consequence that it did. I think Barbara, you're you're by going about uh, sort of telling us about Carlton Watkins, you're, you're getting at kind of something that she's asking in that question, right? Because Carlton Watkins was producing these these photographs of the West in part to to sell the parks, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, by you know preserving. And, and by then creating a tourist infrastructure, which of course drawing people to those very places that were sought to be preserved, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, there's some connection there too, I think. Absolutely. Right? You know, I think he, he, one of the reasons why we looked at him as well, because he was really such an example of the notion of manifest destiny and like, you, we should sell people, you know, we should go there and do this because we can and we have a right to. And, and he also, um, his images both preserve the fruit of Yosemite. He, they were brought to Lincoln, and he then uh, designated Yosemite as the first national park or preserve. Um, however, he also worked for the railroad, the mining, and the lumber mm -hmm. industries. And they were, they were, you know, at that point, they were kind of looking at, oh, well, yeah, the camp, lumber camps can coexist with nature. And it wasn't felt like it, you know, that, that the, it was an imposition. But it pointed up this, you know, this tension between preservation and profit that has been going on and still goes on and, and what, what study does and what, what, you know, like you said, of throwing light on certain things that then create incredible different camps on whether or not that's fueling an economy or is it, you know what? What? What replaces that economy if we destroy that? And, and lots of you know, gets to, they get to be much bigger issues. And legally, who has the right to um, 
for example, in the news yesterday, there's a lake in Florida, Lake Mary Jane, that has sued a company for its own destruction. Um, so likewise with uh, animals and animal rights. So it's interesting how legally these things are changing as well in the sense that who has a right to defend themselves if a lake can sue a company, that's pretty interesting. Or um, an animal, the, uh, yeah, so there's been a lot of movement in that area, legalistic, so. I can talk about a body of work. Um, I've had people come up to me, you know, the, the librarians are just an amazing tribe of people. <laughs> <laughs> when I tried to find places to show my wastewater treatment work, they were the ones who were championing this body of work. And, and yeah, they are so cool. And so I would have people come up to me and go, oh my God, I never realized what was, you know, what happened when we flushed the toilet? And so that was a really powerful experience for me. That whole body of work, and it like, it was like, kind of like, gee, this is a good project to do. And also looking around, there was like nobody else making art nobody. about this subject. So it was like no competition. I'm so happy about that. So that was a really powerful experience for me. I don't know, what have you guys? Well, I was just thinking about a funny. Uh, we were working with a fourth grade class and showed them these pictures, and we were we we were just giving like sugar equivalents, and you know, like in a can of Coke, there are nine teaspoons of, of sugar, and would your parents let you put that much on your cereal in the morning? And at the end, this little girl said, "Well, now you're ruined, Fruit Loops." <laughs> 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 with a skill set that is uniquely yours. You don't have to be an artist, you can be a playwright, you can be, and just, I don't know, I, it's like there's so many possibilities for connecting what you love and care about that people need to understand and with your unique skill set. That's my, that's my big. And writers are artists, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Become involved. Start a club, start yes. an organization, yes. join clubs, join organizations. Vote. Vote, <laughs> yes, oh my God. Pick the, yeah. pick the thing that moves you the most and push forward with that direction. Because we can't do everything, all of us. We can't. So pick the thing that really moves you and then get active in it. Be my suggestion. We have time for one more question. Standing Rock and um, mm -hmm. coral reefs in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, and the Sahara Desert is huge in Iberia, uh, which is uh, uh, Spain is a great deforested and everything, and out west is great deforested. I think that people can really uh, do a great thing, and uh, you know, like she said, she said that uh, you know, like go out and uh, help help the planet, you know, and just do your thing. 
Are you probably not use too much water and stuff like that? Look at that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, and get involved and in prairie restoration, water, watershed restoration. You know, put clean up garbage in the, in the, the, the Cook County Forest Preserves or whatever. You are Cook and County the, out here, right? And talk about these things, because we all have to talk about these things. We can't just sweep it under the rug. The more we talk about it, the better. And I would suggest reading Rebecca Solnit, Hope in the Dark, <laughs> about the long trajectory of, of movements. Because it's really difficult, it's very frustrating to see that um, things come to fruition. You know, and as, as a longtime feminist, you know, we are, uh, we've just seen the slow movement. But, you know, Alice was talking about, you know, the conversations that the language is changing, you know, about the sentience of trees and, you know, nobody was talking about that a while uh, and, and before, and, or the rights of a lake or, a, um, so the language is changing. And so I, I feel like um, keeping, keeping in mind that what we're doing now, you may not see the end of it, but it's, it contributes, everything contributes, and even the small ways of having conversations about it. You know, you mentioned Rebecca Solnit. I recently read Rachel Carson's The Sea Around Us. Oh, if you want, like, rhapsodic yeah. writing, the very first paragraph of that book describes deep time in the most poetic yet scientifically accurate way I've ever read. And her work, she died way too young. Mm -hmm. So yeah. she planted seeds that, that created the Clean Air and Water Act. I worked with Cornell. Yeah. 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 Did she really? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. And this didn't look to see. And did not see moment the fruits of her labor. Work. And yet she can still inspire us and speak to us. Right. And there's seeds. They're put, you're yes. planting seeds. Yeah, I love that idea. Yeah. yeah. Very overstone there. <laughs> yeah, it's an story. I mean, this wrap up has hit all the big themes that I hit in my classes, so I feel it's a good way to. And we're about out of time, so yeah. let's, let's give uh, the artists a uh, thanks. Uh,